Next up is Charis. Charis is a medical student at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that properly. Charis, I'm sorry. <laughs> to me, it's Charis. <laughs> um, yeah, you're studying a you're a medical student, yes. but you're truly in heart a bioengineer. Exactly. Um, you were involved in the iGEM, an open source competition about synthetic biology, and you're now working on a modular oh, lab on a chip platform for the AccubeSat nano satellite. Every one of us has sometime thought about going to space. How about living in space? What effects would that have to humans? And Harris is going to tell us all about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, as you've probably guessed by now, this is going to be a bit more biologically oriented. Uh, so let's get to it. We all know space is uh, not a very friendly environment for us humans. And, uh, in a, and NASA identified the five main pillars that, co that make space uh, such a harsh environment. Uh, and those are the uh, radiation environment there that even with all the shielding it still can cause mutations, the distance from Earth and all the resources that are we, all we currently have are at our disposal, the gravity which affects uh, our body in very profound ways, or actually the lack of it, the entire hostile environment concerning not only space but also the possibility of uh, other planets, and uh, the isolation of uh, space missions, whether that be in isolation from expertise that we have on Earth and can solve problems, or whether it is a more psychological uh, phenomenon which uh, actually uh, we can discuss about it a lot, but that's not the point of it right now. We will focus more on the biology of it. Uh, well. Since 1961, 559 humans have been flown into space. And despite the fact that we know quite a bit about how that affects us uh, on a mesoscop mesoscopic scale, about how that affects us uh, as a, at a system physiology scale, uh, for instance, everyone knows about the changes in uh, bone and muscle microarchitecture, which causes to bone and uh, bone loss and uh, muscle weakness. Uh, but we still uh, have very little knowledge about those effects on a molecular and cellular level. And uh, this is what we decided to deal with. Uh, actually, uh, a recently published study by NASA uh, in this year uh, provided a unique framework for investigating astronaut biology in space. However, well, essentially, the study consisted of two twins. One stayed in Earth, and the other one was uh, deployed in the ISS for six months. And they did uh, a number of measurements concerning uh, different biomarkers. Uh, but that actually, but that uh, study also had a number of uh, disadvantages. Uh, well, some of them had to do with the whole process of uh, storing and transporting the materials from the ISS back to Earth. Uh, the fact that it was just one subject, and uh, most importantly, uh, its exorbitant cost. Uh, experiments about the ISS have an exorbitant cost that most research teams cannot handle, so they remain quite scarce. And a cheaper alternative would be CubeSat and NanoSat missions. And since, uh, they are, since the 2000s, uh, there have been deployed a huge number of CubeSats. However, there have been less than 10 CubeSats focused on space biology missions. Uh, and NASA Ames Center leads the, the field in those uh, efforts. Um, previous missions, such as GeneSat, the CamSat, and uh, the others, have demonstrated that it is possible to perform the necessary functions for uh, cell culturing and observation in space and uh, actually showed quite promising uh, results as a platform for further research. However, they remained quite uh, underdeveloped. And so we decided to take it upon us and do a space biology mission of ourselves. And what we want to do is want to probe the gene expression, changes that happen in microgravity and radiation of the low Earth orbit in uh, eukaryotic cells, uh, cells that are like our own. And we want to do that in a high throughput fashion. We want to get a lot of data. We want to make sense of that data because previous missions have only been able to get very little data concerned because of the preliminary phase that they were in. And, and we want to also perform long-term observation we don't want to do time points like they did in, uh, we don't want to take individual measurements at some time points and try to uh, understand what is happening from there on. We want to observe them for a long period of time and see those changes happen all the time. And lastly, and uh, very importantly, we want to develop and demonstrate a platform 
that can actually enable more space biology research. And we want to show that it can work aboard the a CubeSat, a 3U CubeSat. So uh, this uh, that we're seeing is the almost two unit size uh, vessel in which the experiment will take place. This is a rough schematic of it. And it essentially consists of a unibody formation that is designed to keep everything in place so that uh, the fluorescent microscope that we're using will not be, uh, will not lose alignment with the uh, cells that we want to study. So what we want to do is we want to map in real time uh, the cellular responses of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. This is essentially yeast cells. Those cells are very good models for studying uh, human cells because uh, it's really difficult to do that, those, that kind of experiments in orbit. And it would, it would require very complicated uh, operations which would be quite error prone. So to keep it really simple, the basic experimental setup consists of a, a microscope. Do we have it? Yeah, that, thank you. Uh, okay, the basic experimental setup consists of a microscope which we'll use to visualize our, our experiment. Uh, and cells being cultured aboard a, P, uh, a device called a microfluidic, a microfluidic PDMS chip that, we're seeing, that I will talk about in a little bit. And, uh, and the fluidic system, which consists of a pump, which will essentially uh, cause the flow of the growth medium inside the chambers of the chip so the cells can grow, and the waste tube so that we can collect the waste in a safe uh, manner and not cause any further issues uh, aboard the satellite. So about the microfluidic chip, uh, well, uh, it has been described as the biological and chemical analog of the integrated circuit. So the basic idea of it is uh, most biological and chemical experiments are in an essence, uh, well, mixing different uh, solutions, liquid solutions. So. Uh, a way to do that is to automate this process by using those chips. And more specifically, what is called the multiplexer architecture, which essentially consists of two chips layered on, one on top of the other. And uh, essentially, the, the, uh, the bottom chip can be pressurized by the, uh, by the chip directly above it. And, uh, and in that matter, we can control the flow in different channels. For example, uh, what we see here is uh, you can imagine that the Blue, that, the layer, that the blue layer is the one where we want to control, and the red layer is where the control layer is. So essentially what we do is we can actually pressurize those points that you see with a black cross, and that way we can select exactly which channel will grow. So as we can see here, we have only flow in the cyan channel. So this is the basic idea, so that we can do that in a much larger scale by using large-scale integration for uh, microfluidic devices. And this is how we do that. We actually design a mask, and we layer everything together to make the final chip. And this is what the final chip looks like. It's a very small uh, chip consisting of PDMS. It's a silicon-like substance. And uh, this is, uh, it's actually really small. That little square you see is where the cell culturing will happen. And it's a two by two centimeter square. It's really easy to visualize it. And what you see right next to it is our design. Uh, in purple or pink, magenta actually, you can see the control layer. And whereas in cyan, you can see uh, where the flow will happen. Uh, and the basic idea is that we will use uh, those little t chambers that are formed between in those two layers to grow our cells there and be able to visualize almost 800 different uh, strains at once. So uh, a bit on how that works. What you can see in the upper left picture is uh, the chambers of the chip and those little dots that you see are cells that have been spotted on inside those chambers. And uh, as you can see in, uh, figure in the one next to it, uh, we have closed the valves that correspond to the exits of the chamber. I don't know if it's really, uh, you can actually see it. Uh, so that its chamber is isolated. And right next to that, we have actually closed the second set of valves, which isolate uh, again its chamber, but with some uh, channel directly above it. So what essentially this does is we can flow medium, as, we can, as you can see in the bottom uh, picture. Uh, growth medium is flown in there. Then you close the valves as you do in C. Medium can fuse inside and the cells can grow and we can observe them as they And we don't really want to observe the cell growing. People have done that before. We can get some info. We want to get some, something more. 
to do that, we're using what is called the GFP library. Uh, essentially, this means that we have every gene of that microorganism and we have tagged it with a fluorescent protein right next to it. So essentially, we're growing a number of strains. Each one of them is identical to each other, except that we have a different protein tagged in every case. And what we're doing is we're measuring fluorescence. So we can actually measure the fluorescence intensity and know how much each protein exists inside the sample that we're studying. And we can, and by comparing those results to the, to the experiment we will perform on Earth at the same time, we can see changes that happen when they happen and probably uh, set some light into the molecular mechanisms of quite a few uh, effects that have been observed. To observe uh, those effects, we're building an in-house fluorescent microscope. This is the basic design. Uh, and the main problem with a fluorescent microscope is that it has to fit inside the 2U uh, vessel. So it has to be miniaturized, it has to be designed in-house, and this is uh, our design. It's capable of visualizing the entire chip at the same time. The LEDs are there to excite the fluorophores in the chambers, so we can uh, then measure it um, using uh, a, the camera module and send those uh, data back to Earth. So a bit about the team. Uh, we're a team consisting of 35 members. We, uh, coming from very, dif very different fields of study. Uh, this is uh, the, main, the architecture, how we're organized in this team. Uh, we have, uh, actually, uh, there is no space, uh, aerospace engineering or space science program at uh, our university. So we try to uh, get as much expertise as we can from uh, uh, our mentoring, uh, from our mentors, whether those being uh, universities abroad or companies that are active in the field and are willing to help. And to talk a bit about how the entire satellite is, uh, is built, uh, we have a number of sensors that can actually determine the attitude and a magnet orcus along with one reaction wheel to actuate the uh, attitude control. Uh, the software is implemented by members of the team. Uh, well, uh, the TTNC, uh, we use two antennas, a patch, a patch antenna for the scientific data, which has a, a data rate of approximately 250 kilo BPS, capable of transmitting the images that we will take uh, via the microscope back to the ground stations. Uh, there is a deployable turnstile antenna for t, uh, t, for, uh, on the plus Z phase, and uh, a ground station is constructed AUTH campus, and the uh, board to be used uh, aboard is uh, one developed uh, by Satnox, and I'm sure you'll hear more about very soon. Uh, as far as the electrical and power system go, uh, analog circuits are being used so that we can, re uh, that, uh, we can increase redundancy and minimize software. Those circuits are being designed by team members. Uh, there are solar panels on all available the 3 u CubeSat, and each of them can uh, uh, provide with a maximum of 7 watts our demand by many subsystems, which is quite a bit of a challenge. Uh, as the onboard data handling goes, STM32L4 microcontrollers are used for all basic operations and calculations. The architecture is the 32-bit ARM Cortex-M. Uh, the software used is C++ on the free RTOS operating system. And to protect us uh, from radiation and uh, uh, events, we use internal and external watchdogs, parity check trams, and current limiters. Uh, as far as the structural and thermal analysis go, we're currently performing uh, analysis on the 3U Endurosat frame as well as the in-house design pressurized vessel. And the full-scale thermal analysis is currently uh, on the way. There is, high, there is a need for insulation uh, in our design because there are quite a bit of sensitive components uh, with narrow uh, operational ranges in temperature, and the, the entire scientific uh, experiment requires very strict modulation of temperature at, uh, around, at 30 degrees Celsius minus or plus two. And we have completed the mission analysis for our deployment from the International Space Station. The duration is uh, four to 18 months. Uh, we expect something around nine. And we are compliant with all space debris regulations. And uh, those are our mentoring sponsors. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Hello. 
Uh, my name is Hector. I would like to congratulate you on the fact that as far as I'm aware, being in the field of biology for the last three years, this is the first student AstroBioCube. There is no other CubeSat designed from students, as far as I know, that is in a flight model currently. So, congr so congratulations for that. Uh, also, I have one question. Uh, I have several questions, but my first question is that why you need, this is my, a CubeSat to do your experiment and, just, and don't just use ISS facilities for implementing your space um, environment effects on your samples? Uh, well, very good question. Uh, yes. The two main reasons are uh, the whole point of this, uh, well, not a big part of this mission is to demonstrate uh, how this technology can be implemented aboard CubeSats. The reason for that is, uh, well, if you only have the International Space Station to conduct experiments, you're essentially bottlenecking the entire uh, scientific process in space biology. And uh, right now, if, uh, if you were to compare how, many, uh, how much research is done on biology or biomedicine on Earth compared to what is happening about space, the difference would be huge. A reason for that is uh, the fact that uh, International Space Station experiments are really hard to arrange, to implement. They have exorbitant costs. So if we want to propel that, er that field forward, we really want, need to find another way to perform more experiments by more teams, uh, more independently, so that uh, more results come and we can get a better understanding. So CubeSats are ideal for that. They have a low cost. Uh, it's quite the, the fact that they are very st they're quite standardized allows for easy access to teams that do not have expertise in uh, designing uh, space, uh, space missions or biological space missions. So, yeah, that's the reason. So my other question is, uh, how will uh, microfluidic be affected by microgravity also the considering uh, microorganisms behaving in their growth patterns very differently on I says, for example, from a research we, we have done here in 2009, we know that actually they borrow through their, um, let's say, food, uh, amino acid food, and they actually developed in a different pattern on Earth. So actually, you don't really control neither the microgravity environment nor the, the growth. So maybe this will affect your uh, chamber utilization of experiment. Uh, well, that is uh, very accurate. Due to the lack of gravity, there is no uh, convection, so there's no thermal gradient for uh, growth medium to renew easier. Uh, but uh, the fact is that uh, those clips are made to be essentially uh, they're very low volume and essentially uh, the entire chamber, the entire channels are always filled with liquid and the culture and the process, uh, I don't know how clear it was, uh, actually uh, consists of changing and performing uh, on intermittent, on uh, predetermined uh, occasions, uh, flow of new materials, new growth medium, so that the old cells and the old material can exit the chamber. So. Uh, we expect some different patterns, uh, both in growth and in uh, actually uh, gene expression. We hope to see that. We hope to get some more insight on that. But uh, we do not believe that uh, microfluidic chip functionality will be really affected. Uh, it's very low volume. The, we do not, there is no need for any gravity gradient or uh, anything like that anywhere in, the, in the, its operation. So it should be capable. Uh, and furthermore, uh, PDMS is actually a very... Uh, it's a very good material, it's very good for applications, very elastic, it's really hard to damage, so we do not expect anything to happen with the chip. As far as how the growth will happen, we really want to see that, those changes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.